Hello, in this podcast we're looking at water management and our learning targets are to understand why the demand for water is increasing. We're going to describe the consequences of different water management strategies and describe strategies that enable societies to use water sustainably. We'll start off by looking at some headlines. In June 2007, averting water wars in Asia. June 2011, court hands big victory to Georgia in tri-strait water war. September 2010, Egypt and thirsty neighbors are at odds over the Nile. April 2002, water rights war rages on faltering Rio Grande. May 2013, without water revolution. So we see here that there's already been many conflicts over water. Right here is one place where you can easily see it. Here's Egypt, and you can easily see in the green strip here is the Nile, and the Nile is is a river that's running through a desert, and you can tell that where the Nile is, it's, it's green, there's a lot of vegetation, and where, there, where the Nile isn't, it's completely a desert. There's not much growing there. But south of Egypt, or up, also upstream of Egypt, is another country, the Sudan. What if the Sudan took so much of the share of the Nile that not enough water came to Egypt for Egypt to use the water from the Nile for its own purposes. That could end up being uh, causing a war between Egypt and the Sudan. Likewise, there is another country that is north of the Sudan, and that uh, that's right, south of Sudan, and that is South Sudan. There could very easily be a war between between those two countries too, all over water. So what causes water shortages? Now in the U.S. It, it occurs in at least 36 states. These are mostly in the West. It's caused by a combination of drought, rising temperatures, increasing populations, urban sprawl, and wasteful water use. Worldwide, it's found mostly in arid and semi-arid regions, which are also found in the United States, mostly in the West. Long-term severe droughts are increasing, and uh, they're probably going to continue to increase as climate change increases. And the cities and farms compete for water, and the cities usually win these fights. And as we're saying, in the future, wars will be fought over water. These conflicts don't have to be violent, but they can also be political. And you can see that right now in this clip. If your issue is going to rise above the din, you need a champion. <laughs> you need a hero. <laughs> a mysterious stranger. Anyway, for the good farmers of California's parched Central Valley region, that man was Sean Hannity. Hannity lent his almost comically oversized head to the very real drought problems that these farmers are facing. And you won't believe who Hannity figured out was to blame. You know, this is a very, very simple, simple solution to a problem. Farmers want to work hard. They don't want a government handout. And we have a message to Washington tonight. Mr. President, Turn the water on now. That is so racist. <laughs> oh, just because the president's black, you think he can make it rain. <laughs> make it rain, Mr. President. So racist. Sorry? What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. He, I'm sorry. He blames the government for not letting the farmers draw enough water for their crops because of the drought conditions that have lowered the reservoir levels. I see. The construction of uh, that reservoir, which was originally handed out in the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act of 1935. You remember? It was authorized as part of the 1935 stimulus bill, allocating $500 million for, quote, trans mountain water diversion and irrigation. Or to put that in layman's terms, the government should stop meddling in the business of the farmers who would actually still be living in a desert if not for government meddling. <laughs> history! History! Ah! Ah! History hurts my brain. <laughs> Surely environmentalists must be to blame here somewhere. This is what this comes down to. No water for the farmers because of this fish. Is that what it is? This fish here? Yeah, f that fish! Wait, no! No, wait! Kill it and then f it! By the way, 
way, be sure to check out Sean Hannity's new children's book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish. Boo! <laughs> Boo, fish! Now, I, I assume the salient fact here is that by drawing too much water from the reservoir, salt water would come up river, destroying the habitat of that fish. And, and that fish is important, right? They have all this water that they're sending to the ocean rather to the farms because of the little delta smelt. This little two-inch delta smelt fish. There are actually environmentalists out there who are still defending this two-inch minnow. You're going to keep the water off to defend this little delta smelt fish? Stupid small fish. <laughs> Part of the stupid food chain. Small things should never be preserved. You want to save the whales? Kill the plankton in the krill, then the whales will have more room. <laughs> but wait! If we destroy the lower rung of the food chain, larger fish would be hurt, which may hurt commercial fishermen who are also blue-collar, hard-working Americans who want the government off their back. Who will speak for them? We're not just talking about the delta smelt. We're also talking about salmon. These salmon are food. They provide jobs for people. There's a drought this year. Salmon, boo! <laughs> and boo you, the guy who wasn't smart enough to get Sean Hannity to defend his industry at the expense of a different industry. <laughs> it just makes sense. So what can we do to ameliorate these water shortages? One solution is dam it. Build a dam. And a dam is a structure that is built across the river to control its flow. And what it's done is created a lake or reservoir behind it has several advantages. It captures and stores runoff and releases it as needed. This is especially good when there's when the rainfall tends to not be predictable, so you're able to store water uh, so that uh, you can use it when you need it. It controls floods. It also generates electricity. And, these are, and this is electricity that doesn't pollute, it's hydroelectric power. It also supplies water for, for irrigating farms and also for cities. And the reservoirs can also be used for recreation, uh, for boating and for fishing. Worldwide, there are 800,000 dams and 45,000 large dams, like the one pictured here. And this is a dam that is at least 29 feet high. But dams have disadvantages. Dam failures can be catastrophic, and people are displaced by reservoirs. And they also destroy the ecosystems that they flood. They can also kill migratory fish, such as salmon. Reservoirs also expose baby fish or fry to predators. They also slow their trip to the ocean by month. Whenever the water flow slows down, it starts dropping sediments, and that will limit the life of the reservoir because it continually fills up with the sediments, and 10 million tons of sediment collect annually. Over here we have one of the largest dams in the world, if not the largest. This is the Three Gorges Dam in China. They had to evacuate not just towns but, and villages, but also cities. And many, many historic places had to be moved. 1.4 million people were moved. And more than 100 million people lived downstream. And if that dam ever fails, it would, it would be a complete catastrophe. Another possible solution are water diversions. And this is used in California. And you saw a bit of this in the clip that you saw in, in that clip earlier. And in California, it rains in the winter and in the spring, and the amount is different every year. It could just be a little bit or it could be a lot. And it only rains in the mountains and the north. That's not where people live, and it's not where the farms are. People tend to live in the coastlines, in, in the coasts, particularly in the San Francisco and the Los Angeles area, and also in the Central Valley and the Central Valley is where the farms tend to be. So the water has to be moved from where it rains to where people need it. So the reservoirs will store the water and the delta also stores it. And then the aqueduct moves the water and pumps the water to where it's needed. Uh, now aquifers are groundwater and the aquifers will supply drinking water for almost half the world population. And just about all of Long Island uses aquifers, and in Springfield Gardens, they use uh, you're drinking from an aquifer. Manhattan is not an aquifer, that's surface water that's using water diversions, and the water is diverted from the Catskills using the Delaware Aqueduct. 
aquifers supply drinking water for almost half the world's population. In the United States, uh, it's almost all the world population. It's a fifth in the urban population. And for irrigated farmland, it's about 37% of that. And aquifers are a renewable resource so long as the water is removed at a rate less than it is replenished and the water is not polluted. And that's not true for all places like the Ogallala Aquifer out in the out in Texas, at, we found that in Texas and in Kansas, it's over a bunch of states. There, it's being removed faster than it's being replenished, and that's caused problems. The main problem, of course, is that the the water can run out, and it already has in some places, as you see in this clip. Water collects in a roadside bar ditch, a rare and welcome sight in Spicewood, Texas. Perched on top of the hill country, the community knows the value of a rainy day. After weathering the worst drought in state history in a series of destructive wildfires, Spicewood Beach became the first Texas town to completely run out of water. It's not hard to understand why. Normally we'd be sitting in about 50 feet of water right now and this little alcove would be full of catfish. Dave Beersa is a retired geologist living in Spicewood. When you have an aquifer where the water goes from the lake into the aquifer, as the lake level goes down, the aquifer level goes down, keeps going down until you get to a point where you can no longer take the water out. Residents here are frustrated. They feel the situation was avoidable and a mismanagement of lake water is to blame. More than half the water in Lake Travis is released downstream every year to flood rice fields and irrigate farms. South Texas farmers contend Lake Travis was built to provide water to flood their fields. But that agreement was drawn up before Texas became one of the fastest growing states in the country. Reservoirs became popular places to live and recreate, increasing the demand for water in the lake to sustain the booming economy. People can't put their boat in the water, so you know, no sense for them to come out. Restaurants like Opie's Barbecue rely on lake visitors to stay in business. I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine what my water bill would be if I'd had to you know, truck in some water. Record drought has forced both sides to the negotiating table, but there isn't enough water to appease both sides. Farmers have already been told they will not receive their water this year, and Spicewood Beach is still trucking in thousands of gallons a day to sustain the community. For the Weather Channel, I'm Carl Parker. And another problem, as the water gets removed, it leaves empty space in between the, so in between the soil and in the rocks, and that can cause this problem. And overall, more than half a billion people are fed by grain irrigated by unsustainably used aquifers. Now, the advantages of aquifers are that it is useful for drinking and for irrigation. It's non-seasonal. The water is available all year long. They are almost universally found. And if it's sustainably used, it is a renewable resource. Don't have to worry about evaporation because it's all underground and it is cheaper than most surface waters. Like for example, the water in Springfield Gardens most likely comes from an aquifer underneath Springfield Gardens. The water in Manhattan does not come from under Manhattan. It comes from all the way out in the Catskills. Disadvantages. Um, over pumping the aquifer leads to depletion and it also leads to subsidence, which can be sinkholes or just overall the land just sinks. And when an aquifer is polluted, it stays polluted for decades or centuries because when the pollution is under is underground, it is very, very difficult to get out. An example of this would be um, out in Tennessee, where they did initial testing for building a nuclear bomb for the Manhattan Project. Some radioactive material leaked underground and into the groundwater, and they are having a very, very difficult time cleaning the aquifer there. And, and we'll probably get into that when we talk about uh, Superfund. Also near the coast, there's a problem with saltwater intrusion. When you pump the fresh water out, the salt water can also get into the aquifer from the ocean. Also, when you take the water out, reduced water will flow into surface sources like, like lakes and rivers. And there's an increased cost and contamination from deeper wells. Another solution, particularly in deserts, is desalination. 
and this is converting salt or brackish water. Brackish water is in between so salt dewater and fresh water. Converting that into fresh water. Uh, example of where you can find brackish water is actually around here. If you go to if you go to uh, Jamaica Bay, the water there is brackish. So desalination you convert salt or brackish water to fresh water. Two ways of doing it. One is distillation, where the water is first boiled, and you collect the steam, and then and then the steam is condensed to make pure water. The other is reverse osmosis, where you take a membrane to filter out the salts. It, basically, the water goes through this filter, and the holes are big enough to let the water through, but small enough that the salts can't fit through it. The largest users of desalination are Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United States, and China. So one thing that these countries have in common is that they all have money, uh, so it's only practical if a country is short on water and they're wealthy. The reason why it's expensive is because it takes a lot of energy to get the salt out of the water and also to sterilize it. A negative factor about it is that it removes ions from the soil, so these ions have to be added to the irrigation water. Now we're going to talk about water management from another end, and that is using water more sustainably. One problem is that water is wasted. Now how is water wasted? Usually it's through evaporation and leaks. Like the Delaware Aqueduct, which is what provides water for most of New York City, it has leaks in it. and 15 to 35 million gallons a day leak from the Delaware Aqueduct. Now the way water is wasted is through inefficient systems. Like for example, if you have an old style toilet uh, that whenever you flush, that that flush will use up a lot of a lot more water than a high efficiency toilet. There are also highly highly efficient shower heads that you can get, you can get a very good shower out of it and they don't use a lot of water, and some of the, and a lot of the older shower heads use a lot of water. How much water is wasted? Worldwide, it's 65 to 70 percent of the water. In the United States, it's about 50 percent. Some causes of this. Why do we have all these leaks? Why do we have these inefficient systems? One reason is water is cheap. The government has subsidies where we have money either through tax breaks or just simply giving money to utilities and to companies so people won't invest in water-saving technologies. And without these government subsidies, people will not bother improving water efficiency. Like, for example, if you have an apartment and it, you don't pay a water bill, if, the, if water is included as a part of your rent, why in the world would you pay extra to to buy a water efficient shower head if it doesn't if it doesn't save you any money? How can we avoid wasting the water? What are some things that we can do? Let's first look at how to reduce irrigation waste. Most farms in worldwide are irrigated by flowing water through open ditches. This is called flood irrigation. 40% of the water is lost, and it's lost primarily through evaporation. Solutions to this would be using a center pivot low pressure sprinkler like what you see pictured over here, where the water is sprinkled just a little bit above the plant, and it's under low pressure so that there's not a lot of evaporation. Even better if this is done at night and this is 80% efficient. The other is pictured over here, and this is drip irrigation. When we visited uh, the Brooklyn Grange uh, in Long Island City, that's this is the system that they used. And for this, there is very, very little irrigation because the water barely exposed to the air. Another another thing to do is that while the water is, is to use sensors to monitor the soil so that that part of the soil is only watered when it's necessary. Also, to Instead of using regular fresh water that we use to drink and to use, instead irrigate with treated sewage water. And don't, don't grow thirsty crops in dry areas. In industry, how can we reduce wastes? Well, first of all, the largest users are producers of chemicals, oil, paper, processed foods, and metals. Those are responsible for 90% of the waste. What can be done? First of all, fix the leaks. If you raise water prices, then what that will do is they'll provide incentives for these companies to fix the leaks or to do other things like what we see in the last bullet here where they can recapture the water that they've used purify that water and on site recycle the water in our homes what can we do we use something called xeriscaping and what you can do there is replace green lawns with plants that need little water that can save 30 to 85 percent of the water 
possibly even more in other places, like in Las Vegas. You notice that there's some homes where they have green lawns using grass, just like here in New York. And that's not xeriscaping, and that needs heavy amounts of watering. Or they use xeriscaping where they don't need to water at all. You see that's very bare, but still is, it's still very beautiful, but in a different way. And it saves much more water. For watering lawns, you use gray water. And gray water is water waste from showers, sinks, dishwashers, and clothes dryers. So it's basically reusing water. Also, charge for the amount of water used. Because many utilities charge a flat rate or it's included in the rent. When you are charged for the amount of water used, then there's an incentive for you to use less water. Also, you can use water-saving toilets and shower heads. New York City has a toilet replacement program where uh, they will give you a $125 voucher to replace a old toilet with a high-efficiency toilet. Right now, that's only for multifamily dwellings. Starting in 2015, they'll start doing that for single-family dwellings. Other places, if you bring in an old-style shower head, they will give you a highly efficient shower head with uh, no charge at all. Also, it helps to check uh, your toilet for leaks. So one easy way to check it is if you take some food coloring and just put a couple drops in the tank and you'll notice that the tank turns color. If you just wait about 20 minutes or so, look in the bowl. If any color has leaked into the bowl, that tells you that your toilet has a leak. That means you need to fix the leak. And just like you saw earlier on earlier slides, if you raise the water prices, that will provide incentives for people to conserve water. Now we come to our concluding questions. Number one, why are there droughts? Number two, given an advantage and disadvantage to one, dams, two, aquifers, three, desalination plants. Number three, state one way water waste can be reduced in agriculture, industry, and homes. And that concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.